The Bible details many of God's attributes. One of them is that God is omnipotent. Does anybody know what that means? God is omnipotent. It means that God is all, all powerful. He has all power. It is an attribute that God has that's incommunicable. He does not share it with us. We are not all powerful, right? We are weak, he is strong. But what we see from scripture from creation all the way to redemption from Genesis to Revelation, God's power is, is absolutely on display. And his power is made more personal to us in the ministry and the life of Jesus. Jesus went about when he stepped into his ministry in uh, the beginning of the gospels, it says he came out of the wilderness in the power of the Holy Spirit. And when he did, he started to do miracles and signs and wonders. He healed broken bodies. He delivered people of demonic power. He preached with boldness. He served the poor. J Jesus walked in this power and it was personal to the people around him, but he didn't keep that power to himself. In Luke chapter nine and chapter 10, it says that Jesus gave his disciples power and authority, and he sent them out two by two to go do what he was doing. And the disciples were jazzed about this. They were walking in this power. They were casting out demons. They were healing the sick. They were preaching with boldness. I mean, they went to like chickens, like, on, like afraid to on fire, bold, confident people. They looked like Jesus because of what he gave to them. And they came back and they were rejoicing that demons were subject to them and in the name of Jesus. And Jesus is like, hey, 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 chill out. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. <laughs> you should rejoice that your name is written into the, into the book of life. But the disciples got to taste this power. They got to experience it. And then when you read the book of Acts, what you find is Jesus gave his power to his church to be his witnesses, to represent him. And that's exactly what happened. And it doesn't stop with the pages of the Bible. You actually, if you study church history, you'll see the power of God was available to the church. And it has been increasing, I think, even now all over the world today, that the power of God is still available to the people of God to represent Jesus well. He sent us into this world and he did not send us with just some clever, convincing rhetoric or just some skill or some, uh, some people have a little bit of gifting. And so the best of us will, will speak highly of Jesus and be very persuasive and convincing. No friends, he gave his church power to represent him even in the days that we're living in. And I would ask you a question today. How many of you have experienced the power of God personally, or you've seen the power of God in someone else's life. We're talking about a miracle, sign, wonder, healing, deliverance. Go ahead and raise your hand. How many of you have seen the power of God somehow in your life? That's a, that's a lot of us. That's almost all of us. And maybe some of you wouldn't say yes because you're not sure how to quantify or qualify what we mean by, by power. But did you know there are many Christians today that do not believe that God does what he used to do. They don't believe that the power of God is available to the church or the people of God. They do probably think that God is sovereign and he's still obviously powerful and he can do what he wants. He can do it when he wants. He can do it how he wants. They believe that, but they do not believe that you and I as followers of Jesus have that power that if we just preach the Bible and that's how people will get saved and then God will sovereignly or randomly do what he wants as he feels necessary. But we are just to walk in the word and just to share his word. Now, how many of you believe God's word is powerful and we must share his word? Absolutely. I'm not taking away from that. In fact, I believe the power of God is attached to the word of God when we mix faith with it. But I believe the scriptures teach that the power of God is still available, even though some people would teach that it is not. Now, if you ask me, why do people believe that today? Now, they might say that it's scripture, but I, I can tell you, I have never found a passage of scripture in the New Testament that indicates that the church does not have the same power that God gave to his disciples 
what we read about, not only in the book of Acts, but also in the pages of scripture, according to Paul's letters. I don't think you can find anything that indicates that the power of God has changed in the people of God. I don't think it's there. And so I think the reason that people believe and teach this today, Christians, brothers and sisters, is because it has not been their experience. And experience or lack of experience is not the way to develop doctrine. We develop doctrine based on what the Bible says. If the Bible is not our experience, we don't reduce what we believe down to our experience. We actually need to pray and press into what the Bible says so that what it says becomes our standard and it becomes our experience. It's gonna be a scary world and Christianity would be a totally other thing if what we taught and thought was that if we haven't seen it, then God must not do it. That's a scary world to me. And what it really does is undermine God's word and God's power. If he says you and I are to walk in his power, then we are to believe that, not say it hasn't happened. Well, it must not happen today. And so we are people that, that believe that God still does today what he used to do and nothing has changed. Beliefs must be determined by scripture and not experience or lack of experience. God's power is the supernatural ability to make wrong things right. And he does that in, and he does that through you and I today as his ambassadors, as his witnesses, as his hands and his feet. Here's what we're talking about. It takes God's power to open a hard, cold heart and bring total transformation to them. It takes God's power to do that. It takes God's power to set a Pharisee, a religious spirited person on fire for Jesus to spread his word boldly. It takes the power of God to do that. It takes the power of God to set someone free from an immoral bondage. Something perhaps that's been there forever. Maybe it's even a secret. It takes the power of God. It takes the power of God to bring freedom to an infirmity and a sickness like we read about in scripture and we still read about today. It takes the power of God to bring healing to people's bodies. It takes the power of God to set someone free from demonic oppression, from this darkness, this hovering cloud over people. It takes the power of God. And friends, we need to sharpen each other. We need to encourage each other that the power of God is still available today. And God is still doing those things even in our midst right now, right now. The lack of power in the church in our lives is not on God. And I want to say it this way. Think about all the people out there that, and again, I'm, I have lots of friends people that I love that are in the church and they're born again, they, they love God and, and they don't believe what I believe on this and, and we're, we're right, they're wrong. I know it sounds terrible, <laughs> but I don't agree with them. And that's when you don't agree with somebody, you do think you're right and you think they're wrong. I, I think this is what the Bible teaches. But I have friends and I'm not putting them down. I'm not saying they're not as spiritual as me or you. I, 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 we just have a, a serious disagreement here. But I, but I would tell you that when you get to the at the end of the day, the bottom line here is when you teach that God doesn't do today what he used to do, what you are saying is the reason that the power of God is not available is because God has changed. That's what you're saying. He used to, but he doesn't still. He once did, but he no longer does. What we're saying is God, for whatever reason, has changed. There is something that he has decided that has changed how he does things. And I wanna tell you, that's a really convenient doctrine to have because that's gonna lead people not to pray and not to press in and not to believe and not to expect and not to hope and not to press in for. That's gonna lead people to have more of a casual, apathetic faith when it comes to pressing in to what God says is true. And I, and I know that. That's what religion, religion loves it. This is what Paul said in 2 Timothy in chapter three. He said, there is going to come a time where people are going to believe other things. He goes down a whole laundry list of what that will look like. And he said, these people will have a form of religion, but they will deny its power. That's what they'll do. They'll believe some of the stuff, just enough to, be sit, to sit and to be saved 
to be forgiven of their sins and to go to heaven when they die. Just enough, but they will deny the power to change and transform and set people free and heal and deliver and all of the things that we need God to do today. It's like nothing has changed in the need. We still need that. Just like you and I still need food. And the first century people needed food to live. Nothing's changed. We, everybody, amen, can I get an amen? We still need food to live. Well, we still have suffering and struggling as far as I can tell. And that need still exists. God hasn't changed. What if the issue is not that God has changed? What if the issue is that the way we do our Christianity has changed? What if that's, what if that's the issue? Revival restores us back to believing for God's power again. God wakes us up and says, there's more available than what you're believing for. And I want you to press in. Now, everybody has uh, an iPhone that's more sophisticated than the rest of us. That did not go over well. That was like, <laughs> in the spirit, that was a punch. Somebody punched me, I felt it. Um, just joking. Everybody has a phone most likely, most of us have phones. And there is a setting on your phone and it's called the low power mode. Does anybody know what this is? Okay, here's what that setting is. A couple of you are having a revelation right now. You didn't know you had this setting and you're like, what is this wonderful thing? I will update you. The low power mode on your phone is where you click a setting and what that setting will do is it will shut down programs on your phone that it deems unnecessary in order to extend the life of your battery or the life of your phone, the power of your phone to be able to function longer so that it, your phone doesn't die. It's called the low power mode. I think a lot of Christians have accepted a very low power mode in their Christian life. We have shut down a lot of the things that God says in his word are available for us today and that he wants us to walk in but we have shut down those things in order to extend the life that we have, whatever life that might be. I, I'll shut down the stuff that the Bible says. And so I'm not praying for it. I'm not believing for it. I'm not asking for it. I'm not even talking about it so that I, so that I can just extend the life that I'm, that I'm living right now. So forgiveness for when I sin and heaven when I die. Everybody say, ouch, because it's true. I think the enemy loves this. The enemy loves this. Here, here's what I call the seduction of reduction. Th that rhyme, you can write that down. It's really good. The seduction of reduction. The enemy wants to reduce you and I down to the low power mode of Christian life. Hey, he's fine. He's fine. Hey, you guys want to go to church? Cool. Put a little money in the offering plate. No problem. Once in a while, pop your hand up there. Raise your hand. Yeah, give it up to Jesus once, once or twice, you know. Uh, uh, not, a, not a problem. Hey, you guys want to, you want to like live a moral life, a good life. Not a problem. As long as your Christianity doesn't leave the four walls of a building. As long as your Christianity doesn't infect and affect your home, as long as your Christianity doesn't touch anybody at work, it doesn't go anywhere that you go, it doesn't have anything to say in the other areas of your life, the enemy does not care. If he's lost the battle for us submitting to Jesus, now what he wants to do is just help reduce this life so that all we really care about is preservation. 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 I'll just hang on and hold on and someday Jesus is gonna rescue us out of this big, bad, dark world. Well, friends, it's time for us to unpack and stop waiting for the rapture. God's given us power, healing power, delivering power, saving power, power that transforms hearts, power that does the stuff today that he's always done. We cannot live in the low power mode. And I would submit to you today that if we think about why we don't see the power of God today like it once was available, I would say it's nothing wrong with God. There might be something wrong with our connection. If this LED screen just went, just went black, it just went dark right now, don't do it. <laughs> Amen, don't, don't improve on my illustration. Because they can do stuff in the back room. You guys, you guys can do stuff. <laughs> I didn't plan that. I just had a feeling they were going to do it because they'd be doing stuff. I don't know what's going on behind because some of you, once in a while, a couple of you guys like this, and I don't think what I said was that good. It doesn't match, you know, so thank you. Thank you in the back room. I won't call out your name, but if, 
hypothetically, <laughs> if this LED screen went dark and then everything else still had power, the lights had power, my mic had power, everything was still working. If I wouldn't be questioning whether or not electricity works, right? I wouldn't quit, like, would I be like, huh, I wonder if there's any power to the building. There's evidence that there's power, or just because it's not functioning in this thing doesn't mean that there's not power. We see the evidence of, of power all around. So there, it's not electricity, it's this. You ever have a problem with some kind of piece of technology, and then you call the customer service line? You ever had this happen? Like something doesn't work right. I've had this happen with like my Wi-Fi router or whatever. And you call this customer service line. I feel like I'm triggering a few people. You're like, yeah. I mean, just calm down, all right? Calm it down. You, you ever call and then, um, you know, the first question they ask you is always the most simple. It's like, hey, this isn't working and you're trying to do your best to explain and you know they're not listening to anything you say. Because they have this belief that you don't have. The first question they ask is, well, sir, I just want to ask you, is your television plugged in to the socket? <laughs> but they say it nicer than that, but that's how you feel like they said it. Is it plugged in, sir? Sir, have you actually, uh, have you actually turned the power on? <laughs> You're like, I wouldn't call you if I hadn't checked. And then you look and it's not plugged in. You're like, thank you. I got to go. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but you're like mildly offended that they would ask you the simplest question because you think in your mind, of course, it's always been plugged in. Why is it not plugged in right now? And I want to tell you, there's a reason why they ask you that question is because they have found time and time and time again, the thing that we are not willing to look at is the thing that often is the problem. And it's the most simplest problem. And that's why they ask is it even plugged in? I just want to ask that question today about Christianity. Do we think that Christianity today, and I know this can push you, but you're welcome. Is Christianity the way that we read about in scripture? Are we positioned the way that Jesus has called us to? Because instead of blaming God and teaching, he doesn't do things anymore. Maybe we should ask if the connection is plugged in. I think that's the question that we should be asking today. Pastor Ben, you sure we need a revival? I am positive we need a revival. And this is why Paul said this to the Corinthian church. 1 Corinthians 4.20, he said, for the kingdom of God, the rule and the reign of God does not consist in words, and he means words only, but in power. That Greek word dunamis, power to do the miraculous. The same word that's found in Acts chapter one, Jesus said, you shall receive power. It doesn't consist, the kingdom of God, the rule and the reign of God on earth, not just in heaven, but on earth, it does not consist in mere words only, but in power, power, dunamis power, the power to do what Jesus did. And I think it's a fair question to ask today, is the modern church more taken by words than they are by the power of God? I think it's a fair question to ask because even when you think about how we organize today, we organize around words, we organize around talk. How many of you, you go to a small group and you always wanna get around to praying, but you kinda don't. Praying is the last thing, it's not the first thing. I mean, Leonard Ravenhill used to say, if you wanna see how popular the preacher is, you come Sunday morning. If you wanna see how popular God is, you go to the prayer meeting Sunday night. Say, ouch. <laughs> Leonard Ravenhill, I didn't say that, I didn't. And I think he would say that because he wanted to provoke people and say, do we believe in prayer that we're praying to an all-powerful God that if we ask the Lord to do it, that he'll do it, that we believe God will do it. And friends, listen, our world is suffering. They are struggling. There are things that are happening in our world that you and I, men and women, cannot solve. We don't just need a revival of men and women to solve problems. We need a revival of God's power showing up in ways like we have never seen before. I mean, if you have ever had an addiction in your family, if you've ever dealt with that as a family, you know that, that as much as you've tried to help some people, you get to a place where you're like, God, we need you to show up. And if you don't show up, we have exhausted all of our human efforts. There is nothing more that we can do. Friends, this is why we need the power of God. And it is good for the people of God to feel helpless once in a while so that we learn how to pray again. 
A revival that we need is to believe that God can do what we can't. So when we get to the end of ourself, that's when God starts to do his best work and he wants to do it. There are a couple things that I wanna share with you uh, today with the rest of our time. And the two points up front, I just wanna share with you. When we think about God bringing revival and how his power works alongside that, the first thing is that the power of Jesus awakens us. And we need that to happen. There's a kind of a crazy story in the gospel of Luke, Luke chapter seven, verse 11. Here's what it says. Soon afterward, Jesus went into a city called Nain and his disciples were going along with him accompanied by a large crowd. Now, as he approached the gate of the city, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother. She was a widow and a sizable crowd from the city was with her. When the Lord saw her, he felt compassion for her. And he said to her, do not go on weeping. That's in the modern translation would say, stop crying. (laughs) And he came up and he touched the coffin and the bearers came to a halt. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise, get up. And the dead man sat up and he began to speak. Come on, this, this is awesome. This is just awesome. Jesus gave him back to his mother. Fear gripped them all. Yeah, I think so. And they began glorifying God, saying, a great prophet has appeared among us and God has visited his people. And this report about him spread throughout Judea and all the surrounding region. I bet you they were talking about this for a very long time. You remember when the guy like stood up and he started talking? I want you to notice the contrast here of two different crowds. There's one crowd with the widow and the the pallbearers. They're bringing out the coffin. They're moving out of the city to the cemetery. Uh, Jews would bury their dead the same day. So he probably died that day, most likely. They're walking out of the city together to the cemetery and they're mourning and they're weeping and they're crying. That's one crowd of people. There's a second crowd that we identify and that is Jesus and his disciples and they're walking into the city and they're in a totally different frame of mind. They have hope and joy and they're believing for life and everywhere Jesus goes, people are getting healed. And so they're in a totally different place. And here's what happens. These two crowds, at some point they intersect. And when they do, it says, Jesus, hears the weeping. And this is a, to me, this is a key about the miraculous and walking in the power of God. It says that he had compassion on them. He had compassion. When we have compassion on people with issues in our world, I think it is at that point we feel our helplessness wanting to do something and that's when we cry out for God to move because only he can. I think compassion is a key. I'm just pointing that out. He has compassion on them and then he says, don't weep anymore. And watch this, Jesus walks up and he touches the coffin. He touches the coffin and he speaks, get up. And the guy, (laughs) And he starts to talk. I want to know what he said. Hey, I'm hungry. (laughs) I just want to know what he said. Don't you want to know what he said? This is a crazy story. Jesus, I was actually going to call this sermon, cancel the funeral. And I looked for a casket. I did, but I didn't, I didn't want to trigger anybody because I know that can, I've seen that happen. I didn't, but it was Halloween and I was like, man, you could probably find a coffin. (laughs) Hey, can I borrow that in your yard for a, don't ask why. I just want to, uh, just think, of, think about this. Jesus touched the coffin. These two groups, one group is, is mourning death and the other group is celebrating life. And I just want to tell you, when Jesus steps into our life, he touches dead things. And this is indicative of resurrection. Jesus rose from the dead and he promises that people who believe in him are going to rise from the dead. Do you guys believe this? This makes you kind of crazy, right? You know that. You're kind of crazy. You believe someone rose from the dead and that you're gonna rise from the dead because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He's the resurrection and he is the... And so everything that we see about Jesus is he's the bringer of life. There's a lot of death in our world. A lot of dead things, but Jesus, when he steps into it, he touches coffins and people rise up. And friends, that is exactly what we need. And here's what happens. He awakens us. God's power awakens us. And we start to live again. We need that to happen. The second though is Jesus doesn't just want us to experience his power. He wants to activate us in his power. That's what it says here in Acts chapter one, verse four and eight. And I'll summarize. Jesus comes to his disciples before he ascends. 
and they wanna know what time that he's gonna step into his kingdom and Israel's gonna rule and reign along his side. When, when are you coming into your kingdom? And he says, nobody, nobody knows the day or the hour and I'm not gonna tell you. The father knows he set this, you, it, that you're focusing on the wrong thing. But he says here in verse eight, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, we believe today, continuationists, charismatics, Pentecostals believe that the same power that they received on the day of Pentecost that we see in the book of Acts that's extended through the life of Paul's writings and the apostles' writings that we find in church history, that same power is available today. We believe that, that nothing has changed. And so when he said, you shall receive power, we include ourselves in the you. You is plural. You shall receive power. Now I ask the question, does everybody believe that? Because if we don't, we're not gonna expect that. We're not gonna hope for that. We're not gonna think about that. We're not gonna, when we see a situation that's tough, it's like, oh man, that's pretty tough. That's pretty rough. But people that believe that, hey, let's pray. Let's grab hands. Let's lock arms. Let's believe God. See, see the perspective, what you believe matters here. It matters. Is his power available today or, or not? The early church received it. Jesus wants to activate us in it. And that's my disposition, my story, and I'm sticking to it. So you might ask the question, how do we walk in the power of God? If, if that's true, Pastor Ben, if that's true, how do we, how do we walk in the power of God? So I, I wanna tell you some things. I just jotted these down. First is, and it's not on the list, but we have to be baptized in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not on the list, but I'm just telling you, you have to be baptized in the power. We have to be immersed with God's power, not just saved, not just forgiven for our sins. That's first. And when we are saved, when we give our life to Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us. But he doesn't wanna stop there. Jesus said he wants rivers of living water to flow out of us. Rivers of living water to flow out of us. So we have to be baptized with his power. And when we are, we desire to address the needs of the world. We want to help, even in places and situations where we know that human power and human capacity can't do anything about that. But we know someone, amen, we know someone who does. I'm gonna phone a friend real quick. Let me phone a friend. I've got a hotline to heaven and I'm gonna use it. And so we walk the world, we, we live in this world and we know that God can do something even when we can't. So we have to be baptized in his power. But number, the real number one on your notes here, stop excusing a powerless life. We have to stop excusing a powerless life. There are a lot of excuses that we have. I've used them, you've used them. Theological excuses. God doesn't use me that way. It's not my gift. He doesn't do things like that anymore. I've prayed a lot, it hasn't happened. It's probably not gonna happen again. Hey, we just need to accept what, what is and that's just how it goes. And, and, and I'm not saying that God's gonna give you everything you ask for. And I'm not saying everything's gonna make sense. But I will tell you this, and I think this is an exhortation and a warning is that when we've had an experience where we've asked and we've pleaded and we've contended and nothing happened, if we're not careful, that will shut down our entire prayer life if we let it. You don't have to say amen, but I know it's true. It will shut down our faith in God's ability to do something because he didn't there and something inside of us will shut down if we're not careful, it will happen. And it will cause an excuse to rise up rather than a prayer. And this is how people have built theology. They've wrapped a theology around something that didn't happen rather than what the scriptures convey. We also can substitute God's power. We excuse it by, we have good skills. Pastor Ben, man, this church is great. Lots of good organization. The chairs all look good. Nice carpet. Everything's really, really good. Sermon's okay. But, and then worship was really awesome. And the hymns come on, like, like just the nostalgia of church. How great thou, thou art. You wish that was, some of you wish that was it happened today. Uh, it didn't. But anyway, but, you, but you, oh man, just the, the whole organization piece. Uh, this is so great. And you go right into the Connect After Service and the donuts and the bookstore. And man, it's just such a great, everything's organized so well. It's so wonderful. It's just such a good experience. My kids are all on their best behavior. Everything is great. Everything's great. The message was great, man. I was, those are good words. Pastor Ben's great. And you know what we can do? We can stop right there. But then you gotta walk through those doors back to your life. I mean, this can just be an incubator. This can, be, this can just be a room that's, that's very different from your life. 
And then we go back to our life and we go, what now? This place is supposed to be an activator so that we can live in those places even better. Amen. Amen. That's what this is for. This isn't supposed to be something entirely different and separate, compartmentalized from real life. This is real life. That's real life. But they're supposed to be one and the same. And so we can substitute our skills. And, and once I say amen after the sermon, that's like enough. And I just want to tell you, we can't stop there. Like, Pastor Ben, why do you, why do you ask us to raise our hand after the service? Why do you push us a, a bit? Why do you have us lay hands like I'm going to in a minute? Why do you have us lay hands on each other? Why do, you, why, why, why do we have to have the response? Because we can't just hear the Bible. We have to respond to the word of God or we will do what James said. You'll hear only, but you won't do. And so we as God's people, we have to do that here in our homes and everywhere that we go. We have to be people that respond to God's word. We have to be. And so it's important that when that response comes out of us, we understand that it doesn't just stop there, but it starts there. We respond to God's word and guess what he does? He puts his super on our natural and they come together. They come together. Amen. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 4, he said, and my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. We can't put our faith in just people. We have to put our faith on the power of God, his ability, amen, his ability. There are a lot of other principles that I have there, but drop down to point four, if you guys would. I don't have all the time here to convey all this. Fast and pray regularly. Throughout the book of Acts, God's people regularly what you will find is they hit a situation and they automatically knew we can't, there's nothing we can do. There's nothing, we can't change this. They didn't have the resources. They didn't have the influence. They didn't have the status. They knew right away. You can tell by reading the Bible, they, they, they knew no, nothing we could do about this. People were going into prison. They didn't have somebody in the government that they can call. They didn't have a law that would protect them. People were going to prison for preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. So what did they do? They cried out to God. They stopped eating food and just around the clock, they started to pray. They started to pray that people would get out of prison. They started to pray that God would move powerfully. They started to pray when people were sick. They didn't have some of the doctors or the medical care. They didn't have the ability to do things that even sometimes we can today. So what did they do? They fasted and they prayed. And friends, I... Today, I think we have lost some of this in our Christianity. I think we've got to, again, stop thinking God's not doing things anymore, but look at the connection. What, what are we to do? Is our prayer life, is our fasting, is our seeking of God, is that what we read about in scripture? Because I don't think we can expect to see what God will do if we're not also living out what they did as God responded. We all want the same outcome. We all want the outcome. I do, you do. We want the outcome. I want God to move. I want to see healing. I want all that stuff. I want my loved ones to be saved. People that are so far from God, I want to see that happen. But they were crying out to God. They were crying. Jesus said, go and wait in Jerusalem. They were waiting there a long time. They were waiting for the power to come. Leonard Ravenhill has a book called Why Revival Tarries. It, if you read it, it will cut you open. I mean, it just, <laughs> he's not nice. He's not nice. But if you read it with an open heart, you will find that you're convicted. I read it recently and I was convicted. I'm not preaching at you today like I don't need this. I want to see the power of God, but I need to have a disposition toward the Lord in prayer and fasting where that's the case where the Lord, listen, I've been a Christian. I'm celebrating 26 years this year, amen. And I have learned a lot about prayer. I've taught about prayer. I've, I pray, I pray every day. I have routine prayers. I pray in, in, anyways, I have all this, okay? I'm not an expert. You're not an expert. Nobody's an expert on prayer. We just, we pray. But how many of you know that in different seasons of your life, you keep learning things that you thought you knew? And here's what I'm learning right now, that fasting and prayer is such a simple thing that the Lord invites us into and that when we practice it and we get more clear about what we're doing, 
we watch the Lord move in very powerful ways. You say, well, what do you mean, Ben? Here, here's what I mean. I'm praying specific prayers right now. And I, what the Lord has done for me is he's convicted me to pray bigger and more specific prayers, very specific prayers. Like for example, you might be praying for a lost loved one that has totally turned away from God. Here's what I would encourage you to do. Keep praying that they turn back to God, but start praying really specific prayers. God, I pray that you would send them dreams that would shake them and they would wake up in the morning and feel like they have to call a Christian. They, they got to phone a friend, amen, they have to. Lord, I pray that you would sit them next to a cubicle at their job with a jabbery Christian, one that annoys me, but really will get in touch with them. Amen. I pray that you would surround them with a Christian witness that everywhere they go, the name of Jesus is heard. And just pray that every day. Get really specific and, and watch. I, I went to the gym yesterday and I've been doing this. So I'm just giving you a really silly example. I go to Planet Fitness, the gym for the rest of us. Amen. <laughs> Jimmy, don't say nothing. All right, don't. And so I'm on my way there and I'm meditating on this word, thinking about it. And I'm like, you know what? I'm just gonna pray right now. And here's exactly what I prayed. I'm gonna tell you exactly what I prayed. I'm gonna tell you exactly what happened. No exaggeration, just straight up. So I prayed, I said, Lord, I ask that you would send somebody to me while I'm working out who engages me in a conversation and then I end up talking to them about you. Just like that, okay? And then I get into Planet Fitness and I put my earphones in and I do my thing. And I don't, I mean, I'm not nothing, there's nothing here to brag about, but I mean, I just, when I get in there, I'm gonna work out and I go. I just work out and I go. I don't have a lot of time. So I'm in there and I'm on the chest press and I'm doing my thing. And this young guy walks up to me and he looks over at me and he's looking at the machines like he's lost. And he walks up to me and he starts talking and I couldn't hear him. So I took my earphones out and he starts asking me where a specific machine is. I didn't think anything of this. I've already forgot that I prayed. <laughs> okay. And the name of the machine, I don't know what the name of the machine is. And so, I, so I'm like, man, I don't really know. And at some point in this questioning, it dawned on me what I had prayed. Okay, it just dawned on me. Now I have to confess to you, in, I've been at Planet Fitness for five years and there, I have never once not even one time. I mean, for whatever reason, I am not the guy that people walk up to and ask about weightlifting. I'm just like, there's just nothing here where they're like, that guy must know. They just don't, they just don't, <laughs> I'm sorry. They just don't see me and go, that's, we're gonna, he's got it all together. So I have never had this experience in my life. And this guy starts talking to me about all these weights and names and stuff. And so I get up, and I start helping him. And I seriously, I have no idea what he's talking about. He's got some list that some weightlifter YouTuber gave him or whatever. And I don't know what this is. I'm like, is there a code somewhere in purple at Planet Fitness to share with me what this? So we're like trying to figure it out. And then I end up in this really awesome conversation with them. And uh, I remember it about the, anyway, so I, I, I'm just saying, I prayed that prayer on my way to the gym. I have never been approached ever. And this guy walks up to me and starts talking to me. And I start helping him with something that I don't know anything about. <laughs> and I didn't help him, by the way. <laughs> I think it's this. So, you know, I hate it when people do that. I think. Okay, so you don't know. I think. I don't know. I pray that, guys, I want to tell you, we, the power of God is available and we access it through our prayer life. And he's call, he would call us to pray very specific prayers. Stop feeling powerless. Stop, just, we need to stop feeling powerless and start recognizing that God is with you and God wants to live his life through you, the life of Jesus, the spirit of God moving through you. But we've got to get in touch with our Christian life and start asking God to do things that perhaps we haven't been asking him to, to do ever. Or we just go to the store and we just go to the gym and we just go to work and we just go to church and we think nothing of it. Status quo, this is what I expect. This is what's gonna happen. What if we lifted our expectations beyond what has been normal in our life and we said, God is ready to do things if we are. God is willing to do things if we start stepping into it. God is here today and God wants to do things that perhaps we didn't even walk into the room thinking that he was gonna do. God is willing to do that. What if we started lifting our expectations from the mundane life that we're so accustomed to, that we're so used to? Amen. 
And so I would tell you today that we need a revival. And as we seek for God to move, the power of God is attached to the word of God. People do not need what we can do. People need what he can do. And that's what we're here doing today. We're talking about what Jesus can do. That's what I wanna encourage you in today, the power of God. Would you stand to your feet to pray us out here today? Would you mind bowing your head as I pray? I just wanna ask you a question. Um, And this also is for anyone in the foyer and the chapel and online today. I know not everybody's just in the room. There's people that are all over uh, all over in this building watching and then and at home. But if you're here today uh, in any of our rooms and you have not surrendered your life to Jesus, the, the first and most important step for you is to take that, is, is to give your life to Jesus Christ. Yes, he forgives us of sin. He cleanses us from unrighteousness. He, he makes all things right. What he does, no one else can do. And he'll do that for us today. For any of us today that need Jesus to step into our life and make what's dead come alive. He is the one that can do that. He is the only one that can make what is dead come alive. And he wants to do that today. And so if you're here, I wanna ask you this question. Have you given your life to Jesus? Do you belong to him? Are you following him? Do you know him? And if you haven't, and you want to today, here's what I want you to do. I want you just to acknowledge that in your heart, you're like, Ben, I wanna do that today. I don't know what that means. I don't know what that looks like. I'm not gonna have you come up front in front of everybody, but I just wanna ask you the question. Is that you today? Do you want to make Jesus Christ Lord and Savior of your life? If so, I want you to raise your hand. I want you to look straight at me today. Ben, I wanna give Jesus my life. If that's you, yes, sir. Yes, I see your hand. Thank you. Is there anybody else? Yes, sir, I see your hand. Thank you. It takes a little courage to do this. I want you to acknowledge it. I want you to look at me. I want you to raise your hand. Yes, yeah, I see you. Thank you. I know you mean it too. I know you mean it. Is there anybody else? There's, there's three of us today. Yes, sir, I see you. Yep, yep, yeah. Anybody want to join them saying, Ben, today's my day? That's why the Bible says, today is the day of salvation. If you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. God God wants to come into your life and absolutely change everything from the inside out. That's what he does. So the four that raise their hand, what I'm gonna ask you to do after the service, I'm gonna conclude, but I wanna encourage you to come forward. We have our pastors and our prayer team available. We wanna pray with you. And if you don't have a Bible, we wanna give it to you, but we wanna pray with you to receive Jesus. We wanna encourage you in the decision that you're making today. Don't just walk out, just come down and let us pray with you. It's just a few minutes, but it's really important prayer so that we, you know what you're doing. And then if anybody here is not water baptized and you want to be today, I also want you to come forward. But for the rest of us, would you put your hands out before God and here's what we're praying today. I'm gonna pray that we get baptized in the Holy Spirit. I'm not asking for a show of hands. I'm believing that's every single person. So if you don't want this to happen, you're probably in the wrong place, but we are still glad that you're here. <laughs> you could be here no matter what, but I wanna pray for you anyways that God would immerse us with his power today. Let's ask him together. Father, we thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. We believe that your power is still available today and all over this room. I know there are people, we need your power to show up in our life, not just for us, but in our families. We need your power to show up in our workplace. We need your power to show up in our neighborhood. We need your power to show up in our extended families. And Lord, we need your power to show up in this church. Only you can do many and most of these things. And we're asking, Lord, that you would baptize us in the power of the Holy Spirit. If that is your desire today, ask him, Lord, baptize me in the power of your Holy Spirit, that I would be activated with the power of Jesus. Give me compassion to care about the needs of the people around me. Give me faith and confidence to believe that you have the answer, you are the answer, and to step out in faith to see you do what only you can. And also as I close, is there anybody here today that you need a healing in your body? You need a miracle in your life? You need a deliverance? I want us to be bold and I just want you to raise your hand. Pastor Ben, I need need that today. Just raise your hand if it's you, just raise your hand up. 
Okay, if you're around them, put your hand on their shoulder. If you're around them, put your hand on their shoulder. We're just gonna simply ask God to do that today. Lord, we thank you that you meet our needs in Christ Jesus, that you're a miracle worker. And we ask you in the mighty name of Jesus and for your glory all over this room, we pray that you would bring healing power from the top of our head to the bottom of our feet. Whatever's wrong, Lord, we ask that you would make it right. We thank you for your testimony coming from your people. And we also pray, Lord, any miracles that are needed, whether that's home or family or whatever, we pray for the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit to be released in our life today and this week. And we ask you, Lord, for deliverance where something is plaguing our soul. And we say to you today that whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We thank you for your freedom and your healing and your deliverance. In Jesus' mighty name and all God's people said, amen and amen.